Hey everybody, Scott Roberts here with Jason Genzel, The Vast Reaches. And uh, Jason is here with us today to, uh, well, to give us kind of an introduction to who he is and what he does, uh, the kind of uh, things he likes to do in astrophotography. Uh, he is followed by tens of thousands of people on Instagram and throughout social media. Uh, he's doing an amazing job in astronomy outreach. Uh, he is an Explorer uh, Alliance ambassador, an astrophotography ambassador, uh, kind of a new category for us in presenting people who are doing outreach. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you'll see why uh, astrophotography is an important part of outreach today, especially in the social media world. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me, Scott. I appreciate the opportunity to come on here. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys enjoy the presentation that I have for you today. I um, encourage you to stop and, and ask questions or make comments at any point during this. But yeah, I'm just going to go through a little bit about what I do, um, you know, how I create the astrophotography, um, how I share it. And I, um, I'll take you through a small gallery of some of my images just so we can talk about them and see all the opportunities that are available for people who want to get into astrophotography, who uh, want to try it, or for people who just uh, enjoy looking at the night sky or are curious about uh, those sorts of things. Um, so we can start right into the presentation if you want, Scott. I don't, Go ahead. Do you have it up on the screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll probably ask you some questions myself, Jason. So. Oh, yeah. 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 At any moment, stop me. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so a cover page here, um, just... Um, what I said, we're going to talk about, you know, sharing the universe through astrophotography and it's um, amateur astrophotography has come a long way over the last decade and uh, the ability for people to do this from their backyard um, on a limited budget, um, the, the cost of entries coming down, the opportunities are increasing. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit about what's possible. And as Scott said, you know, we've I've gotten to know each other over the last little while here, and um, he's offered to have me join this Explore Alliance Astrophotography Ambassador Program, which I'm happy to do. Um, and I think, you know, if I cycle back to my former self, you know, five, six, seven years ago, you know, I never really thought of what I was doing um, as outreach. I, I thought of it as, um, you know, just trying to make nice pictures and improve my process. And, um, you know, I'd share it with people, but I was, you know, a little bit guarded. I was at first maybe a little embarrassed by my result and as my results got a little bit better um you know I, I wanted to share those a little bit but i was still protective of it um but you know as time goes by you know and as i've put a lot of it out there i've grown uh, following on social media i think it's evolved into an outreach endeavor you know so that's what i'm going to share with you a little bit today so as i said um and i think this presentations coming through with you in the corner here right Scott so I'm yeah. just gonna keep moving you around uh, <laughs> off of content but <laughs> I feel lost um, in the cosmos here with uh, right his flying through space that's right. um, so like I said you know I'm exploring the cosmos from my suburban backyard things like this weren't possible you know a decade ago um, to get the kind of results that we get today mm -hmm. um, this image that you have on the background here it's one of the ones I'm most proud of. Uh, this is the Cat's Eye Nebula. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope made this a famous space target, and it's mostly because of this core here. If you can see my mouse, the Hubble image is just a small crop right around the core of this Cat's Eye Nebula. It's an incredibly detailed nebula, but it has this extended halo uh, web of gases around it. And not only that, but off to the side here, there's a uh, satellite, not a satellite, a distant galaxy. <laughs> um, it's not even closely related to this Cat's Eye Nebula. It's right. um, yeah, over 350 that, million that, light years away. Halo uh, around it looks like maybe an interacting galaxy or something. So right, yeah. So you got a little ring up, like a it almost looks like a polar ring galaxy. But um, you get a sense here for the scale. You know, the Cat's Eye Nebula is we're looking at thousands of light years away versus the galaxy off there in the distance is 350 million light years away 
And yet this is accessible from a suburban backyard. And I think that's what surprises a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying, that's the message I'm trying to, to push. And um, I get a lot of people asking the question, um, you know, how did you get to where you are? What, um, what inspired you? What steps did you take to, to start taking these images? Mm-hmm. Um, can I do it? Um, how, how do I start? You know, they assume it costs, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, but, I think uh, the important thing here, <clears throat> and I put a, this up here to drive home a point, that image there in the center at the top, that's my first astro photo of a galaxy. Um, and that was taken with a digital SLR camera kit. You can see the details of it here. But it's something that a lot of people have, even at home, they could you know, produce an image like this of deep space. And at the time, I looked at that image and I thought, I cannot believe that I just captured a, a galaxy. another galaxy from, you know, throwing a camera on a tripod and taking a 22 second picture, right. uh, which is essentially what this is. And I stacked it up from two second exposures, but because I was on a fixed tripod, I didn't want the, stale, the trails from the stars to, to reach across the image. So I, I kept the exposure short and I stacked them up and I got that result. Then you fast forward a few years, and I took that same camera on a proper telescope, on an equatorial tracking telescope mount, took one and a half hours of pictures, and I produced what's there at the bottom. So um, it shows you that the limitations um, were partially equipment, but they were partially um, self-induced because I um, I was able to take that same camera and produce a drastically different result. Spectacular, a spectacular image. But uh, even your first shot, you've got desk lanes that you can see. Uh, you can see that the arms do stretch out across the field of view. And so- and I, think you're being, I think you're being generous, but- <laughs> Tripod, so that's, that's amazing. That is yeah. amazing. But yeah, no, at the time I was, I was incredibly proud of that. You know, and I was emailing it out and like, like look what I, you know, look at this picture I took, but- um, right. Man, you know, you, just the, the uh, willpower, the determination, and, you know, some money, but people ask, you know, what does it cost to get into it? And that picture at the bottom there, if I don't include the camera, which I had already, you know, it's less than $1,500 in equipment. You know, it's a, comparable to a, an iPhone, you know, if you're going, going to buy out a, a new iPhone. So right. uh, whether you call that accessible or not, I think people have various degrees of that definition, but um, I don't think if you spread over, you know, a couple of years, the investment to, to oh. you know, get yourself a rig like that, you, um, yeah, I mean, you, don't you think, think it's unreasonable. They go skiing, a, a vacation yeah. skiing. You take you, uh, your spouse and your child and boom, 1500 bucks is gone, mm-hmm. you know, so. And you just went skiing and I went to another galaxy. So there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I, again, I can't say enough, you know, how, how amazed I constantly am at the process and the results that we can get mm-hmm. um, with a modest setup like that. Right. So that's what I recommend to people. You know, how do I start? You start as simply as possible. Take your camera that you have, any camera you have that's capable of taking a long exposure. Just put it on a tripod. Try it. You know, you'll quickly find out what kind of person you are if, if you want to pursue it or if it's like um, not something that you're interested in at all but uh, there's almost zero investment for that and then you know as you step in step into it it gets more and more progressively expensive and I in retrospect I look and you know I can't believe you know the the where it's taken me um, and you know investments I had to make but I want you know those are things I chose to do and I could have had a, a hobby golfing could have had a hobby fishing but you know those things are transient, you know, the, the results don't last. Um, I mean, your golf skill may last, but, um, you know, I have these pictures that I can pull up at any time. You know, I took this picture years ago and I can pull it up and I, I'm still amazed at the results. So. Sure, sure. And then um, fast forward another few years, so um, and I, you know, upgraded my equipment a little bit more. I got um, a longer focal length telescope and took a picture of the same target. So this is still the Andromeda Galaxy. And if I flip back and forth here, this area right down here uh, from this image is blown up here. 
And this telescope is able to resolve individual stars within the Andromeda galaxy. These are blue supergiant stars within the cluster called NGC 206. <clears throat> and the dust lane detail pops out. You've got the um, nebulosity uh, from hydrogen alpha gases. Uh, so we're viewing nebula, stars, and, and um, you know, dust of, of the Andromeda galaxy here. Incredible. And a, just a beautiful image anyways. One of the things I will remark is that when I look at the, your image, the images, it just looks like uh, gems sparkled on, on uh, you know, black velvet. They're just, they're just beautiful and stunning to look at, so. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, that's one thing about my process is I really focus on, on all the details. Um, a detail-oriented person, I guess I can't help that, but. Um, you know, there's a lot of time investment in the in the whole learning process and actually acquiring the image. You know, there's 10 hours in here, and I really I feel like I owe it to the data, owe it to the process to do it justice, and to spend time, you know, revealing the result. All right, so here's a little bit about me. Um, you know, people may know me from various online platforms. Um, I go under the name. The vast reaches on Instagram, where I have a um, you know my my largest following, but also I'm you know active on Facebook, Twitter, and and Reddit, and I use that same name across all those platforms, so it's pretty easy to find me. And then um, you know I also post on Astrobin, which is a, an astrophotography specific site. Mm -hmm. you can search for me by name there. But as far as me personally, um, I have an engineering background. That's where the detail oriented thing comes in. Um, and problem solving, but um, I worked in aerospace and automotive industries and in product development, analysis, and testing. But I've had this lifelong interest in space and astronomy. Um, and that's one of the reasons for going into aerospace engineering. But um, in 2009, I got an interest in, in uh, photography as DSLRs were kind of becoming uh, available uh, for reasonable price points. So I got a camera in 2009 and started taking landscape and um, um, other photography, but I um, started researching a little bit into astrophotography because of that interest, and I started to realize things were possible, um, you know, capturing these things at home. So in 2013, I got a telescope, and since that point, um, you know, I started learning what it took to to do proper astrophotography. And I, I was real stubborn at the beginning. I, um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to invest money in it or, or the time. So I, you know, for a couple of years, I kind of did it casually from time to time. But I say around 2015, 2016, I really started dedicating my time to learning how to do it well. Yeah. And uh, since then, it's all been what was the history of... Uh, what was the tipping point for you? I mean, this is... I, I see this all the time. I've been, you know been selling telescopes for a very long time, seen people get into it, they'll buy some equipment, it, it lingers, you know, for a while, they, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I see various things happen. Sometimes it's the influence of somebody else um, that uh, inspired them, or an event happens, like an eclipse, or, you know, the yeah. comet hits uh, Mars, or, or Jupiter, you know, so, um, what, what was it for you that, that kind of pushed you to start doing that? Yeah. So I don't have that one thing that happened that that, I, that was the moment. Um, like I said, uh, 2013 on, I was I was strapping my DSLR, that same Canon T1I I showed those pictures from earlier. I was putting that on the back of my telescope, and I was getting, I would say, decently good results uh, towards the end once I learned how to manage the data from that camera but it's not an optimal camera for the job and it had a lot of deficiencies that i was having to correct um, in post-processing it's time consuming a lot of effort what happened to me and why i i started to become more focused is i got a dedicated astronomy camera a monochrome camera capable of being cooled and that eliminates so many problems with um with dealing with the data um, and getting good results quickly. Mm -hmm. And since that time, um, I think that was the singular thing that 
um, enabled me to get better results and, and inspired me to keep pushing. Um, and once those good results started rolling in, I think it just kind of snowballed. I realized, you know, I kind of the sky's the limit thing, no pun intended, but um, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, J Jason, uh, we have uh, several people have joined us. Uh, Dusty uh -huh. Haskins, he was on with us last night. Peter Moy, he says hello from New York City. Um, mm -hmm. Monica Toddy, she says hello. Uh, Douglas Struble, uh, my J my buddy Jason. Uh, yeah, we my got buddy. together. <laughs> we get together once a month. Great guy. Um, uh, Ron Andrew Sternhagen, uh, very interesting. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah. Greg Devore uh, says hello. Uh, Dusty. Uh, Dusty Haskins remarks, Douglas, you two together, the amount of AP knowledge and amazing photos. You know, I think he's got like a birdie swimming around his head. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining. I know a lot of those names. So, um, yeah. And Tara yeah. Bomalski Moore. Awesome, Jason. So interested and amazing. I cannot wait to show the family. So there, there we go. But, uh, well, thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, and if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, not only do we have an expert in astrophotography here, but uh, Jason uh, loves doing the outreach. And, um, you know, uh, we were talking earlier, and he does wane philosophical about these things. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. But let's get back to your uh, presentation. Well, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining. I, some of those names go back to high school for me. So. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> cool. That's cool. <laughs> All right, so I can figure out how to advance the slide. There we go. Okay, um, <clears throat> not going to spend too long on this, um, even though Scott is, is an equipment manufacturer. Um, I started making a list of the equipment I use, and it quickly turned into an incredible eye chart. Um, complicated, especially for people that don't know what they're looking at. So um, I'm boiling it down to these three main categories, telescopes, mounts, and cameras. And... Um, there's a ton of ancillary gear that comes with this, um, not to mention support software and computer equipment and cables and you, you name it. But <clears throat> I've got four main telescopes that I use, um, and these are listed out by aperture. So I've got an 8-inch SCT telescope, which is this one you see back here, a 6-inch refracting telescope, which is this telescope in the foreground um, that's an Explore Scientific telescope, and I've got a 6-inch and an 8-inch Newtonian and those are um, the telescopes that I own. I also use various camera lenses for other types of photography, um, astrophotography and daytime photography. Uh, I've got three motorized telescope mounts, which are these um, down below the telescopes that drive the telescope across the night sky to track the stars. And I also have a small portable star tracker that I'll take out and do uh, Milky Way shots with. And then I have... Um, several astronomy cameras um, you can see them here on the picture they're the little um, these are ZWO uh, cameras attached to the back of the telescope right. got five separate ones of those I've got two digital SLR cameras and I even do some astrophotography with a little GoPro camera I have so um, that's pretty much the equipment I use again I could do a hour-long presentation just going through all these uh, gear setups we got a couple of questions here Okay. Uh, uh, Wayne Arnold uh, asks, can you use an Astro SLR like the Canon RA for daytime regular use as well? That's a good question. Uh, you can, yeah. The, so the, the, for anybody that doesn't know, the, the uh, Canon RA <clears throat> is a purpose-built camera that um, Celestron made for astrophotography. And the difference between that and the, the normal Canon R, EOS R is that they changed the infrared blocker filter in front of the sensor so it was sensitive to further into the infrared and that allows the light from hydrogen alpha emission nebulae to pass which is a deep red color so in order to do that they had to um, to modify that filter and so the images that you get if you shot in the daytime with it can have color casts associated with it. Right. right. And color casting can be removed in post-processing, but sometimes um, not completely. It can still leave a red or 
magenta tinge to the image um, and doesn't present a natural color balance. So the answer is yes. With custom white balance settings, you can do it. Um, is it ideal? No. Right. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Douglas Struble, uh, he had a couple of questions. One was, is uh, what's going on, um, going on under the tiger's hat? And then he said, uh, it's not really a question, but a comment <laughs> that Jason helped me a lot when I, would, I would got started four years ago. Sometimes he's over my head as an engineer, but it's made me push myself. So I think that's what it's all about, though, is, um, is having people like uh, Jason to, um, uh, you know, take, take you under, under his wing. And, uh, you know, that's, that is uh, something that you see, uh, you know, it's all over the amateur astronomical community. You know, it's very different yep. than almost any other uh, type of uh, community you can get involved with. You know, regular photographers don't share as much as astrophotographers do. So, well, that, yeah, that's very true. Um, you know, and people being protective of their processes and um, and what they do. I mean, that that's um, yeah, that, that comes a lot in uh, photography communities. Yes, I think. You know, and I value, you know, Doug and I have talked a lot, you know, I, I value the personal interaction with people. Um, you know, I I consider my work and social media um, to be some form of outreach, um, an important form of out outreach, but uh, that personal interaction is, is what I really place value on. Um, and so, yeah, we have a local group that meets, um, we talk through you know, issues we're having, our results, and, and um, you know, I think it helps a lot of people, um, you know, but that is a small community, local, so that that's, true. that's one thing that social media affords you is the ability to reach outside that group and oh, yeah. um, go nationwide, worldwide. Worldwide, that's right, yeah. and it inspires people. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, the astrophotography is really inspirational, not only because it's beautiful, but... Uh, you know, and I, I think you're going to get into this a little bit, uh, Jason. But uh, what, what, uh, how you interpret what they're seeing is also critical. You know, so. Yeah. So I, I put together this slide. It goes a little bit about things you can do in astrophotography. And from the outside looking in, I think a lot of people um, view it as pictures of the stars, or um, you know, it's limited to taking pictures of galaxies and nebulae, but um, once you dig into it, you realize that there's all these subgenres and, and ways you can special, specialize, um, paths you can choose, and things that you may enjoy doing more than, than others. On the left side here, um, there's a whole branch of amateur astrophotography that deals with actually doing real science. And uh, people do photometry, which is studies of um, brightness of variable stars. Um, transit events of celestial bodies. Um, they can even ex do exoplanet searching um, with backyard equipment these days. Um, right. Spectroscopy looks at um, emissions or um, um, chemical compositions of, of objects in the night sky, be it um, uh, certain stars, or they can do um, exoplanet um, evaluations. Planetary research, um, if you think about amateur astrophotography, um, pretty much any time of day or night, somebody's got their eye trained on one or the other of the planets. Uh, that's very valuable to science, um, and uh, even professional observatories don't necessarily have that capability. So um, some of that data is, is fed back to the professional realm. realm. Um, occultations um, are events where you can... Um, trace light curves or uh, positions of asteroids or uh, bodies in the solar system. Um, even uh, NASA or scientific communities uh, value observing meteor showers and getting counts of uh, density and, and things like that. So there's just a long list of things you can do that are science-driven. What I've chosen to, f um, to focus on is um, what I call pretty pictures, and that's just you know taking pictures of the night sky and um, you know revealing its beauty. Um, there, there's uh, night sky photography, which focuses on galaxies and nebulae and uh, star clusters. You can take pictures of planets. You can take pictures of the sun, the moon, comets and asteroids, um, satellites, 
um, the Milky Way galaxy, uh, wide angle nightscape views, and um, also special events, eclipses and uh, meteor showers and, um, you know, planetary conjunctions and alignments up in the sky. So I hope that just gives an overview of, man, there's a lot of things you could do. That's um, true. And yeah. Some people do one thing, one singular thing and specialize on it and become really, really good at it. Um, but everything on the left or everything on the right, I've tried to dip my toes into to various success. So. We got a couple more questions here. This is from Peter May. He says, I'm a longtime photographer with a collection of Nikon lenses from 16 to 500 millimeters. I've dipped my toes into astrophotography with a small ioptron tracker, and I've noticed that the majority of the photos I've taken uh, with, with are t are, were taken with refractors. Can you go over the pluses and minuses of each type of telescope design for photography? Uh, that's that's you could go way deep into that one. Yeah, that's a big topic. <laughs> yes, it is. I will answer with a. And Scott, we've talked about this. You know, I try to take whatever I can and get the best results out of it. Yeah. You so what's the there's definitely pluses and minus to all to all those types of telescopes and lenses. There's drawbacks to certain ones. There's um, there's benefits to using certain types, but mm -hmm. there is no limitation whatsoever on getting a decent image out of any of them um, with enough that's right. focus. That's a bad word because it <laughs> you have to be focused. But the um, you know with enough attention to detail and uh, attention to the process, you can produce decent results off of any any type of telescope. Yeah, results that will blow you away and that you'll be proud of, you know. And we'll do the job as as Jason's astrophotographs do. We'll do the job of inspiring others, and that's really, you know, uh, he, Jason had the branch between science imaging and and uh, maybe the aesthetic kind of imaging. But uh, yeah. I would say that the inspiration of seeing something that's beautiful, um, especially makes you wonder uh, and makes you imagine, uh, leads more uh, people into science than, than um, you, know, all, you know, not all the data of, of what research scientists do, because that is astounding and amazing in itself. But, uh, um, you know, a, a good example of that is Carl Sagan's uh, pale blue dot. You know, uh, at the time when he wanted to turn the uh, Voyager spacecraft around and, and take the shot of Earth as just a blue speck in our solar system, the scientists were really against it. The team was against it. They said, what scientific value is that? Well, it turns out that that's like one of the most important uh, images of, uh, of the 20th century. So it's, it, is, uh, it is something that as, um, as far as humanity goes, to, to look at yourself from that perspective is... Uh, um, is pretty amazing so and I, i'll say this um just related to that question that came up um if you have specific questions if anybody has specific questions on this stuff mm -hmm. reach out to me personally i i get a uh, a lot a lot of messages personal direct messages um, on the platforms that i use just asking qu various questions i try to get to them all and i'm i'm more than happy to to help people out on the journey. Um, I made a lot of mistakes um, and I've learned from them and I have those lessons and you know I, I can I can help prevent somebody from making the same ones if they reach out to me so I have no problem answering direct questions if you want to um, send them my way. Yep. Will Jarvis says hi thank you for all the work that you do. As a beginning astrophotographer it's great to see what you've been able to accomplish. What do you think of a 102 millimeter refractor as a good scope for both galaxies and some nebulas as well, or nebulae as well? Most of my mm -hmm. AP interests are in galaxies, but I want to do a bit of nebulae too. I, I started imaging with my parents, eight inch SCT, and it's a royal pain. Okay. <laughs> I want I a small test. scope, but not too small, like yeah. a lot of people recommend, uh, like a lot of people recommend for beginners. Yeah. I. Th I I think the 102 is a very versatile scope. Um, <clears throat> you're going to have problems. Um, you know, it's a mid-range focal length, so it's going to be good at both, but it's not going to be exceptional at, at either. Um, 
you can definitely shoot galaxies, galaxy clusters with a 102. Mm-hmm. Um, but the focal length isn't going to give you the re- reach that you want for some smaller galaxies. Um, by the same token, the, the focal length is maybe a little too much for a lot of the larger nebulae. Right. So it's, it's a good middle of the range scope. Um, excellent to get started on. But, you know, you may find with time that you want to extend the range, uh, get a longer focal length scope, or go the other way. Um, people usually navigate towards the type of photography they like to do. Um, some people just go for it all. And um, if you wanted to do that, you would probably use the 102 for your entire imaging career. It could be. could be. Yeah, yeah Foreign's telescope can do actually quite a bit. Uh, Ron Andrew Sternhagen says it has to be very satisfying to know that you can capture such amazing images. Awesome. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I mean, you, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, you picked up a guitar, you couldn't play it, um, you know, at at first, or you, you you could make it, you could make a sound, uh, and, and, and now, you know, and now it's like you're an accomplished musician with the, you know, that would be a, a good analogy, I think. Um, your, yeah. your equipment seeing, you know, through your process and your perseverance and your practice. Um, how does that feel? Well, I, it's rewarding. And, um, you know, I, I play guitar too, so I can relate to that analogy. But, um, you know, I've never ceased to be amazed with, you know, the results that I'm able to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but in every image I make, I, I feel like there's room for improvement or I can identify something I can do better next time. So it's a perpetual improvement thing. And I never, you know, I feel some sense of accomplishment that I've achieved some things, but I don't by any stretch feel that I'm where I want to be. Um, right. So I don't know where it's going to take me just further, I guess. That's right. It will. You're right. Interesting. So, uh, let's, let's get back to your presentation. All right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Scott and I talked a little bit about outreach. Um, and, you know, at its core, essentially, you know, sharing this stuff on social media and reaching out or ha- and having people reach out to you and ask questions, and, you know, that's a form of outreach. Um, I broke down outreach into a few categories here because there are, you know, different kinds. And what I call classic outreach is um, anybody who's been in – in astronomy circles or has gone to a star party has had that that time where they are at a star party you know with a bunch of telescopes set up and you, you walk to the back of the star party and there's a astronomer there you know a, an old guy with a, a beard down to his belly you know just waiting for you know fresh meat to come to his telescope and to tell him about this thing that he's got a telescope pointed at and um those, those guys are a, a wealth of infra, of knowledge and, um, you know, that's outreach at its finest. They want to teach you about what they're, what, what you're seeing. They want, they want you to use their top of the line equipment to, to get these views and these experiences. Um, you know, and that's classic outreach. And, um, you know, when Scott and I talked earlier, you know, I mentioned that those, those days are few and far between now. Um, but, um, cause they required dark skies and, you know, they would have star parties out in the middle of the, the desert or, or no places where there weren't that many people. Um, uh, but what that's expanded into a little bit is, um, sidewalk astronomy, um, which Scott says he's, you know, he's involved in a, a bit now. And, um, you know, that brings telescopes out to the places where people are. Um, so that's, yeah, yeah there's still a lot of value in that kind of outreach, um, you know, there's traditional media outreach, which is um, NASA images and, um, you know, images that are pushed out by professional telescopes to the to the mainstream media. There's books and magazines, um, Internet news outlets, uh, all those all those places serve to inspire people about space also, because um, that's a lot. Of, that's the exposure that a lot of people have yeah. um, more recently with, you know, the rise of social media and this stuff. Um, you know, there's become a larger social outreach um, on these platforms, which I call kind of a virtual outreach because um, you're sharing this amateur astrophotography um, via these platforms. And the challenge we have there is is, is the way people consume this media. And, um, you know, you try to get people to 
not just scroll past it and, uh, you know, throw a heart on it and scroll the next picture and put a heart on it and scroll the next picture. You really, you know, out, part of outreach is, is education and then teaching people what they're looking at and provide that sense of wonder that uh, you have about the topic. Mm-hmm. And so one way I've, I've really tried to do that is to, to place that context um, wherever I can whether it's a description um, at the image, uh, you know, at the bottom of the image, or um, some sort of graphic, or something that allows people to to understand that this, you know, this isn't just like a make land of make believe. I mean, you can actually go out into your backyard and and uh, see these things, take these pictures um, with the right amount of motivation. And if it's not your thing, there's people out there doing it. Um, oh, yeah. That you can follow or or in your own backyard, you know. So, and uh, you know, with the the right techniques, the the narrowband filters and stuff that you use, um, uh, you know, uh, you can do some amazing stuff, you know. So it is all about getting out there and doing a lot, you know. So yeah. So the important thing is that you know all these involve getting stuff out there and sharing, right? you know, the, what I place importance on in, in this process is, is reaching out for a crowd that maybe doesn't have access to, to space. I mean, people don't all have the access to the equipment I have. They don't all have access to the um, skies I have. They don't, access, they don't have access to, to, you know, people that have a telescope. So, you know, being able to put this in front of people um, that – aren't used to seeing it is a a very rewarding experience. And if you can inspire the next generation of um, involvement in, in space, I think that the, the dividends, um, they, they they would never stop repaying Um, because there is a, there's a genuine curiosity. um, Absolutely. You know, people, uh, people want to learn about this stuff. They want to know what's out there. Right. You know, it's exploration, exploration. It's like, um, you know, when, the European explorers came back from, you know, North America, you know, people wanted to know what they saw or, um, you know, they didn't have the means to go sail there. So, um, right. like I said, the, the, um, what I place value on is, is the personal interaction and the, uh, engagement you get back on this stuff. Um, you can't ever let in any of the, I guess social media is a, is a, can be a nasty place um <laughs> but oh yeah you never want to let likes and follows be the goal i mean you want you want the reach and the engagement to be the goal um and the feedback and the and the two-way communication to be the goal um because if you focus on a um you know getting some kind of self gratification um uh, from you know getting a few likes or getting a few followers if you focus on that as a goal you're not you're not you're heading for a day yeah. that's true that is very true you know uh, uh, George Philip the sixth uh, said my most draw dropping jaw dropping view was seeing the veil nebula in a 24 inch daub uh, classic outreach uh, situation he said this can create a great memory that will last a lifetime I've never seen a large aperture t- amateur telescope of that scale or the veil nebula before that moment uh, you know, that, that stuff does sear thing. Experiences like that do sear in your brain. Um, yeah. uh, but, uh, as, uh, Jason's pointing out here, not everybody gets that opportunity, uh, to, uh, to experience those kind of things. More people should, you know, uh, for sure. But, uh, but I think that, um, <clears throat> that, you know, certainly through astrophotography, um, uh, I see it as a, as a critical, um, uh, aspect of uh, outreach. It always has been. Um, um, and photography in general is really intertwined with astronomy. Some of the very first photographs ever made of anything were astrophotographs. You know, so you have the moon, uh, Orion, and the, the, uh, the techniques that uh, astro- or the performance that astronomers always demanded to go deeper and better uh, pushed uh, film companies like Eastman Kodak to develop technical films that were specifically 
designed for science imaging. Uh, and then with electronic cameras and stuff like that, um, the first you know, electronic CCD camera I saw was uh, at Palomar Observatory and it cost millions back then. It was, uh, that was back in the 70s. Uh, and I thought, wow, maybe they'll come down to tens of thousands of dollars or $100,000 maybe for an amateur astronomer one day. Well, now you can buy them for, you know, you can buy them for under a thousand dollars, you know, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things I said about sharing this stuff is is context. You know, if, if you look at that image on the right, um, you know, you, you see nebula out in space, and, but um, general public viewing this, um, you know, they don't see you really past that. You don't, um, you don't get an understanding of what's in the image. Um, so, you know, some of the things I try to do is, you know, create graphics that, um, you know, can maybe show some, some, some details in here that, that are casually overlooked. Um, you, you don't realize sometimes what you're capturing and how, um, amazing that can be but the um this image actually has a black hole within it and the evidence of for that black hole is is um right here on the screen so this uh, the um bright object here is a stellar mass black hole um it's got a relativistic jet a jet of gases coming off of its pole and that interacts with the the gases out here and creates this bow shock in the interstellar medium so if you flip back and forth um between these images, you can see that physical evidence of black hole being there, but you know, without the context, it's um, yeah, you don't know rather that. meaningless. I thought that was a cool one. That is very cool. Now, through the telescope, visually, even through a very large one, Cygnus X1 just looks like a uh, a tiny dot. You know, so mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's interesting to see uh, where that's coming from, but. Uh, um, but it's uh, that photograph really, really lays it out there. All right, so um, I went through a little bit about me and the you know the work I do, you know, and how I share. But now I've got a gallery of images here. We can just kind of flip through to show a sampling of of what's possible to the amateur astrophotographer. Um, you know, if there is any questions on that first part, let me know. But now we're just gonna gonna you know flip through some cool pictures here and you know absolutely jump in if you have a question about it or, or want to know any details on the image um what i have on the screen here <clears throat> now this is not hubble space telescope image right no no this is shot, <laughs> shot from my backyard this is the uh this is, amazing. Nebula. This is uh, beautiful one of the larger nebulas up in the in the night sky um it's not an extended nebula. It's it's um, roughly the size of the full moon in the sky, but um, this is a very zoomed-in view just of the core of that nebula shot through narrowband filters, which isolate the emissions of certain gases, and an um, infrared filter, which um, was layered into this image too. So you can see the, the details in the chemical makeup of the nebula and um so sharp look at that yeah some pillars that these are star forming yeah those are all lobules of dust and it's a nursery of baby stars out there yeah. dusty haskins says sometimes all it takes is once during an outreach event that creates that wow moment for a person and once astronomy ap gets its hooks in you you're toast there's no looking back <laughs> i would imagine that's true um uh, Barry Allen says, Sidewalk Astronomy Public Outreach is an extremely important tool that engages the development of this awesome science. Uh, all true. Um, lots of thank yous here. So. All right, good. Well, I'm glad everyone's enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, <clears throat> on the show and tell time. So this is... Um, NGC 6888 um, is the designation of it. This is the Crescent Nebula. So this is a nebula formed from the um, gases blown off by a um, late-stage star 
It's called a Wolf Rayette Star. And this was shot from my backyard um, with an Edge HD 8-inch uh, SCT telescope. And through hydrogen alpha filter and oxygen filter and uh, RGB filters. So this is a rough approximation of a true color image. Whereas that first one we looked at, or the previous slide, was a uh, was a false color image. This is actually a, a true color image, and this shows um, the extended oxygen nebula um, encapsulating a um, a tangled web of hydrogen uh, within. And this image comprises of uh, almost 27 hours exposure. Good lord! Yeah. Amazing. I was really happy with the detail that came out of that one. Um, I, I just wanted to show us, you know, like maybe one of each type of image that I, that I work on. So this is a galaxy shot. <clears throat> I just kind of picked this one because I like the, uh, the fine structure in it. This is NGC 5033, spiral galaxy, uh, 50 million light years out. Um, and it shows some deformation of the arms. Um, you can see this arm here is bent upward and this one downward. So that points at an interaction with a with a galaxy somewhere in the past, but they don't really know. And that's one of the reasons why I like shooting images like this is because you're kind of at that edge of exploration where science doesn't have the answers for a lot of this stuff. Um, it's still under investigation. And, um, you know, we get to go out there and see this stuff that's, you know, on the verge of the unknown. Yep, absolutely. And this is a wider angle shot um, with a 50 millimeter camera lens looking above the plane of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is down here and it's looking up towards the Andromeda galaxy. And um, the Andromeda galaxy is currently moving towards us in a few billion years. It will intersect the Milky Way creating a, uh, a new galaxy, essentially, uh, of the remnants of both, a larger galaxy. And so um, I just thought this interesting. This was an interesting shot for perspective, showing that uh, incredibly large Andromeda galaxy looking like a small speck out there in the distance and our home galaxy in the foregro foreground. The um, star... Gazers may notice that this is the uh, Cassiopeia constellation here, the W of Cassiopeia. Right. And this smudge right here, which um, can be seen as a little red smudge, that's actually the Pac-Man nebula. So that's this nebula here. <laughs> wow. In the, in the foreground. But again, I just like the way that this uh, presented that sense of scale. Um for an astrophotographer, you can shoot camera lenses and you can get an incredibly wide perspective, um, pretty much a vista of the night sky, or you can really hone in on the details if you have a long focal length scope. All right, so on to uh, another type of astrophotography, planetary. So this involves just shooting the planets, uh, the main planets. I've shot Pluto too. It is a planet. I don't want to hear anybody argue that. Um, but this uh, this is Saturn, shot in 2018. Beautiful. I had a lot of good images from 2018, uh, planetary wise, because um, number one, I was using a large ap aperture telescope, and number two, I was um, it was during the Mars opposition where Mars comes as close to the Earth as it does in its orbit. Um, and so I was able to get some detailed shots of Mars. That, act, that opportunity is actually coming up again in October where Mars, Earth will make another close approach past Mars. Uh, this is my best Mars attempt so far. And this was taken just a few days, uh, I think it was a few days after the opposition uh, in 2018. Yeah. So during this time, the Mars was enveloped in a global dust dust storm. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but the entire northern hemisphere of Mars here is actually covered in a dust storm. Um, so no detail is visible, and there's still a haze over the lower 
uh, southern hemisphere of Mars, but you can begin to make out the, uh, the details on the surface there and also the uh, polar ice cap. Awesome. What I really liked about this image is the blue haze of the um, water vapor atmosphere, and the atmosphere actually came through across the northern hemisphere and, uh, and around the limb of the planet. So again, that was, yeah. that's my best attempt at Mars. I'm, I'm really proud of that image, and planetary imaging takes an incredible attention to detail because you're shooting at such a long focal length that every little thing matters so much. And uh, not the least of which is the at the Earth's atmosphere and the seeing conditions, which is the turbulence of the air you're looking through, um, can be disastrous to, uh, to a, an image that you're taking. So you need a still night, you need a lot of focal length, you need a nice telescope um, that's well aligned and you need um, to take a lot of uh, basically short frames um, to, to uh, average and stack and right. you know, come out. Yeah, and those are what? That's how many? 7,500 total. Yeah, so this, this image was shot through RGB, which is red, green, and blue filters, and then combined to make the true color image. Um, I shot 2,500 frames per filter, so that's how many I stacked. I think I shot 10,000 per filter. Um, so yeah, 20, uh, 25,000 frames per filter. So 7,500 frames total, 7,500 pictures were compiled to make that image. So the actual, the, um, you know, the actual integration time of getting out there, um, to get together that took what an hour, two hours. How, how long is, is Yeah. Well, Time capturing, actually physically taking the pictures, uh, I, it shoots at a couple hundred frames per second. So you can do 10,000 frames and just, you know, what, I don't know, I'm blanking on the math, but maybe like 20 seconds or something like that. Right. You know, you, you can capture the frames. It depends on the frame rate for, for the filter. But so in essentially a minute or at most a couple minutes, you can capture all that information. Um so definitely the most time-consuming part for planetary is getting out there, setting up, you know, getting focused, getting on target, and uh, waiting for the atmosphere to behave. Which is a big part of it. Uh, yeah, so I also asked, uh, and, I, and another person answered, but uh, uh, they want to know where you go to get shots like you get. And uh, you mentioned the first part of your, uh, your presentation that uh, you uh, you shoot all this from your backyard, right? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, it's all, I mean, all from my patio. Like in yeah. super dark skies. What's special about where you live? Uh, that I'm here, I guess. <laughs> 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 but you know, I um, people always ask about my skies, and the, the assumption is you need really dark skies <clears throat> to to take these pictures. I live in. A suburban location um you know for those that know the Bortle scale i'm about five in the summer and six in the winter winter's worse with the snow cover it reflects a lot of the ambient light mm -hmm. uh, you know so it's probably classified as Bortle six but that's like mid-range on the scale um it's not exceptional but one way you can overcome that especially for the deep sky astrophotography is number one shoot narrow band which is essentially a light pollution filter um, and it focuses your imaging just on specific wavelengths of light where gases from nebula emit. Or you can shoot in broadband, which is essentially true color, and just take a lot of exposure. That's why some of my images have 20, 30, 40, 50 hours of exposure. Is the more exposure you pile on, the more it averages down the effects of light pollution. Um, because light pollution is a source, a light source in your image, hmm. and it's got a noise associated with it. And by taking more exposure, you can average that noise more and more to a lower level. Um, and that's just through the averaging so that you reveal the signal of the object. Sure. Sure. Very good. All right. So I wanted to throw this in here um, showing this image which is a composite all these images all these planets were captured in the moon were captured in one night of imaging and that was just a few nights ago maybe a week what is it, a week ago on april 6th and 7th mm -hmm. uh, 
all these planets are up in the sky right now. So at dusk, you can see Venus, which is this this uh, planet here. Incredible. And then in the morning, the uh, parade of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars are rising at dawn. And through the coming months, um, they'll be rising earlier and earlier until they'll, um, they'll be visible all night long. Uh, we've got a really great planetary season coming up as Mars but as we get closer to Mars, Mars is going to grow um, to about two-thirds the size of Jupiter here. And I should mention that all these images are captured at the same scale. So these are how they appear um, in relation to each other size-wise. But seeing the moon here below gives you a, a scale of reference for your eye to really realize how small these planets are in the sky. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is shot through uh, the... Um, Explore Scientific 152 telescope, um, and I've got to set it up behind me here. If you yeah, guys, saw this, it, this, that just blows me away. That blows me away. This telescope was was um, when I brought this telescope out. I never envisioned it to be a uh, a precision astrograph. Uh, you look at the images here, and th this is a six inch refractor. It sells for under a thousand bucks. Um, I think you even purchased one from our silver grade stock, which was... Uh, yeah, I, I saved some money. <laughs> you saved some money. So uh, that image of Venus is probably the best image I've seen of Venus from an amateur, uh, uh, any amateur uh, astrograph or astrophotograph. The images of uh, the moon, Jupiter, uh, really astounding. You know, you, I don't see any chromatic aberration. Uh, and this is this is because of the te techniques that you are doing, okay? Right? Yeah, right. So I, um, what I've done here, you know, realizing that it's an achromatic telescope, um, for anybody who doesn't know what that means, um, achromat is a two-element lens in the front of the telescope. Um, it's cost-effective to, I think, produce, and that's why the cost is low. Um, that's right. And it's still produces a sharp result, but it produces a sharp result at the center of the visual spectrum, which is green. But outside the visual spectrum at the extreme ends, which are red and blue, you start to get um, less sharp results. So you'll get yeah, all essentially the halo in your image. Time, right. What's that? All the colors are not focusing at the same Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Blue focuses on one side of focus, and then red is on a, another side of focus. So you you are actually, if you're looking at it across the visual spectrum, not everything is in focus. Right. But one thing you can do with a monochrome camera is split the visual spectrum into components, red, green, and blue. And you can use your sharp result um, in green for the luminance, mm -hmm. which is the brightness of the image, and that presents the detail to the eye and then you can use red focused separately and blue focused separately to add the color in with the green component to the image so then you've got more sharp results in, in RGB to layer on top of a sharp luminance and you end up with an image that has very limited color aberration in it. Um, now it's not to say you can't get a better result with a different telescope in fact I Literally guarantee you can. But what this shows is what is possible with a Acromat telescope um, with the right techniques applied in post-processing. So this is a expanded view of the Venus from the last shot. So this was shot on the 6th of April as Venus is getting more and more into a crescent phase, which means it's getting thinner and thinner. It's also sinking faster and faster into the dusk. So over the next month or so, it's going to pass between us and the sun. And then come June, July, it's going to start being visible in the morning again. And we'll be able to see the crescent phase of the other side of the planet. But um, this shot, you know, I was really happy with. And I took those techniques and I expanded on them one step further and I used an infrared filter for the red channel and an ultraviolet filter for the blue channel and that expands the color palette and allows you to see some variation in the cloud deck of Venus so you can get the blues and the 
and the rust colors in the cloud deck. And that's just amazing. I love it. All right. Is everybody still with us? Are we good? Looks like, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. And so one of the reasons Scott and I started talking was the, the capability of that telescope to do solar imaging. So this is a look at a few shots of the sun. Um, this is a look at the chromosphere of the sun and a solar filament stretching across the surface of the sun and some details within the, uh, the solar surface. This is the sun in hydrogen alpha through that 152 millimeter telescope wow. and a proper solar filter that looks at hydrogen gas. So this, uh, this is a view of the last major sunspot that the sun had, which is almost a year ago. And um, just a it's really, really so sharp. It's incredible. Yeah, satisfying amount of detail came out of this. Um, looking at the, the structure of the magnetic field well, <clears throat> across the surface of the sun because these the chromosphere lines actually, um, these plasma tentacles actually follow the magnetic structure of the sun. And uh, one other wavelength that's available for solar observation is in the deep purple, which is calcium emission and that looks uh, you get a little bit different look at active regions of the sun uh, with these bright speckled uh, appearance mm -hmm. appearing regions but yeah it's a it's an interesting way to look at the sun and this is colored according to where it lies in the, in the spectrum which is a deep deep blue beautiful and then uh, this is a look at the another look at the solar solar chromosphere and this image I put in here because it got um, a really nice response uh, when I shared it um, and is actually was actually um, you know selected as, um, as one of the um, shortlisted photos in the, uh, the the astrophotographer of the year um, yeah, that's amazing. program at the Greenwich Royal Museums in England but the uh, these solar images, they're, they're false colored, which means that the, the actual capture is in black and white because we're looking at a very thin segment of the visual spectrum in the deep red. So a lot of them are colorized afterwards, and I found that colorization like this really um, triggers a response in people, and they, um, they really like to see it in this way because I think it's relatable. It's, it's the vision a lot of people have of the sun with the blue sky and but, um, yeah, it's just a false colorization. But, uh, again, you know, a nice sharp result in the detail. I mean, as you look out towards the horizon, it just it gives you uh, a feeling of the immensity of the power of the sun. And, um, you know, uh, even though it's not like some giant uh, prominence coming off, the structure and detail of what you see right there uh, just kind of off in the distance. It just, uh, you know, it makes me feel like I'm in a spacecraft, you know, seeing, you know, coming up on the sun to see all that and just being like awestruck. Of course, if I was that close, I'd probably be frightened. Yeah, I've, you know, I've imaged the sun a lot now, obviously, but I've never seen another structure that looks like that on the limb of the sun, um, at least not in that sharp detail. I think you know, it's a really active prominence, but it's it's positioned. If it's not right on the horizon, it's a little bit past it. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's nice contrast to the uh, the structure. Yes, I agree. All right, so this one hopefully it plays for people, and this is an animation loop of about a couple hours of activity on the solar surface, and this is looking at. Again, these uh, spicules, which are the plasma fingers sticking up from the photosphere into the chromosphere of the sun. And it's this visible edge you can see here. Um, and it just shows how much the sun it's crazy. dances around with activity um, on such short time spans. It's just um, it's continually active and 
when I post images like this, these also get a, a huge response from people because they just, you don't realize it. Um, anybody who sees the sun up there just thinks it's doing the same thing. It doesn't move, but um, on, on a small scale, it's, it's, it's incredibly active. Right. That loop right there, uh, you could probably fly the planet Earth through it. I mean, it's... it's uh, yeah, these... That's big. These stand about an Earth diameter or more off the surface. Right. Just to give a sense of scale. And you can watch, you know, these... Over two hours, this thing has flown, you know, four or five Earth's diameters sideways right. um, through space. It's, it's, it's amazing uh, the speed at which those things move. Yes. Actually, if you look at that long enough, you can start to see that the whole structure is actually rotating. Oh, like a tornado. Yeah. yeah. Look at that. That is crazy. Anyway, I was, I was hoping that these videos come across well on the live stream. Yeah, you can definitely see them. I'm watching. Uh, I have a okay. larger screen here to look at. Them. All right. So then... Um, the moon, um, again, you know, I've been able to get some sharp results on the moon. Um, and I, the moon shots are always a hit because people, you know, it's a relatable thing um, for people to, to see the, the detail in the craters and things like that. So I've uh, shot a lot of that with my SCT. And I, I've done a couple processes where I really, really dig into the colors of the moon. And so these actually show the... Color, the coloration in, in the surface of the moon, but the saturation is driven to a point where it's, it can be revealed to the, to the naked eye. And it shows the difference in the mineralogy of the, the um, regolith or the, you know, the, the um, soils in the, in the lunar surface. So the blue tones represent titanium dioxide, and then the reddish tones are um, the iron rust or the, the iron oxide um, materials. In the, in the soils and you know beyond that the the highlands the, the craters and in the, the mountains they show off as a, a brighter color because there's less uh, space weathering associated with some of these like the uh, the ejecta which are the the rays that extend out from the craters uh, show a lot of detail and variation in color um, so you know you kind of look at this images and the, you know more you zoom into it the more you look the more details you see. And so that's, I think, why that resonated with a lot of people. All right. Uh, so one other thing you can uh, try your hand at, if you're uh, handy, is imaging comets. And this is Comet Atlas, which just recently disintegrated um, over the last month and is now multiple fragments, fragments flying through space about to uh, round the sun. But I was able to capture this one over a four-hour period and then animate it. So this is the comet flying against the backdrop of stars over uh, time-lapsed over a four-hour period. This was taken with a one-shot color camera, <clears throat> so you can see some star color and also the the green, the eerie green glow that's associated with the nucleus of a lot of comets. Yeah, you're getting, uh, people are saying your images are coming across very well. All right, good. Your presentation, that's great. All right, so another thing you can try is a uh, imaging the International Space Station. And the, the best, or the, I'll say the easiest way to do it without having to try to track it across the sky is to catch it when it passes in front of an, a larger object like the sun or the moon. And I was able to capture uh, it crossing the sun at least a few times. Um, I've failed every time trying to get it across the moon, but we'll get there someday. A lot of these, uh, there's prediction software or websites that you can go to to put in your location. And uh, we'll tell you when these events happen and you can go out there and uh, maybe you have to drive or maybe you're lucky enough, lucky enough for it to happen over your house, but you can... Uh, capture pictures of it as it crosses in front. So this is again through the 
170, uh, sorry, the, the AR-152 telescope and the ASI-174 camera. Wow. And this is the International Space Station moving across the face of the sun. Now, is this in real time? I mean, is this... No. So this, the, the transits happen very quickly because of how small the apparent size is of the sun and how quickly it moves across the sky. Generally, the transits are about a second in duration. Wow. One second. So this is shot at a high frame rate and essentially take uh, 20% the speed of, of the actual transit. So it's a slow motion video of it flying across the sun. Holy smokes. Now, the other thing that is coming across, you have to, you know, if you look at it enough times, you can actually see that the, there's surface movement going on on the sun itself. And, uh, and this is, you're saying this is, this is uh, about a second of, of uh, real time. Right, yeah. Um, you know, and that just, some of that. Some of it may be yeah. seeing conditions, but. Yeah, it might be, yeah, right. It could be seeing, it could also be, um, you know, camera noise. Maybe you're seeing frame to frame a, a speckle in the, in the camera noise. But I've taken this shot and I don't have it in this presentation that in retrospect it would have been a good thing to do, but <clears throat> I focused or I stabilized the video on the ISS itself and tracked it as it moves across the sun so that the station is stationary in the field of view. And you can absolutely see the surface detail drift drift by in the background of that video. So that's, a, that's a, another cool way to look at it. Um, I've got that posted up on Astrobin. Maybe you know, if somebody's feeling the inspiration, they can go dig it up. Absolutely. Or if we do another one of these, I can I can present it. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're getting towards the end of um, these disciplines that I've tried my hand at, but the uh, one which I really want to improve on, and I've. Uh, only had a chance to do it. Um, I've only had limited opportunities to do it. Is, is Milky Way and nightscape photography? Uh, this is a lot easier for some people to do than other people, because light pollution is an absolute killer for Milky Way photography, um, and nightscape work. Um, so people, you know, have access to darker skies out west or elsewhere in the world. Um, they have they have the ability to go out to these places where the light pollution is pretty much a non-issue and get really detailed looks at the, the wide field Milky Way. Yeah. Um, this shot was taken under severe light pollution and you can see that in the washout on the right hand side. But, you know, again, it just shows what's possible um, even from a light polluted zone. So you can see um, some of the nebulas in the southern or the toward the core of the Milky Way, you know, there's the lagoon, the, the trif, um, the trifid, and the um, oh, what other one? The uh, omega or the swan? I think is in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm calling them out right, but anyway, Lagoon, the um, Lagoon South. the other thing you can do is uh, what I call nightscape is you know find a nice terrestrial foreground and get a picture of the Milky Way with this you know the sky behind it, which is what I've done here. I shot this up in northern Michigan and. And uh, find found an interesting rock formation and, and got a frame just so the Milky Way was was passing right behind it. Awesome. Yeah, really beautiful. You know, gear for this is a lot different than gear for deep sky or any of those other disciplines we talked about before. For this, all you really need is a camera, a wide angle lens, and um, the gear that you need that most people don't have that at least people that haven't gotten into this yet is a tracking mount. But they have available very simple portable trackers that yep. you can fit in a backpack that you can take out with you and set the camera down on. And it'll track so that the stars stay stationary. Um, and so for this one, I did one shot tracking the stars. I did a one shot uh, for the foreground, and then you just um, you know blend them together in post processing. So yeah, it's taken in two segments, but the you know the camera was in one spot for the whole thing. Uh, we had um, people are giving you uh, compliments on your images. Um, mm -hmm. Really, uh, I mean, they, they are stunning, amazing shots. Uh, Barry Allen is asking me, did anyone connected uh, capture the 2012 Venus transition the sun 
with one of your scopes. I'm going to say yes, um, uh, as I remember the event, um, but uh, I can't remember who. So um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, look up um, uh, on um, Astrobin, perhaps. Uh, you can do a search there or uh, also just uh, looking on uh, Google Images can help. Yep. Okay. So right. yeah. So leaving. this is the last one I've, I've got in here. This is, um, you know, a popular one. You know, when there's a, an event happening up in in space, it's usually fairly fairly well pop, um, you know, fairly well advertised. You know, you find a, a bunch of media outlets um, calling it out. But it's fun to go out there and, and try to capture these events as they're happening. Um, because they're so popular, you see a flood of images, but um, everybody's take on it's a little bit different, and uh, it's an enjoyable thing to do. What you're looking at here is the total lunar eclipse that happened in January of 2019, so that was a year ago, January, um, and that's where the Earth passes between the moon and the sun, so our shadow is cast on the moon gives it that nice ruddy appearance and you can see this is right as we were coming out of the eclipse and the sunlight started hitting the surface of the moon again right. and when the moon dims down like that you can actually see the background field of stars uh, i've done an animation where you can actually you know see the moon drifting through the star field which is really cool and um wow. you know this is another event that was heavily photographed but this is my take on it this is the 2017 total solar lunar eclipse that is beautiful. so this is when the moon moved between us and the sun and you can see the earth shine which is the light reflected um off the earth back to the moon which illuminates the the dark side of the moon there and then you can see the solar corona behind it this is uh taken in multiple exposures and then composited together to get that incredible dynamic range that the event has and reveal those details amazing so uh, once again um so <laughs> yeah that brings us to the end this slide was supposed to be a thank you and i wrote thank you on it but it won't show up for me but um i want to thank you for everybody who just uh you know tuned in and watched and uh, complimented you know the images i I really share this stuff to you know promote the the hobby and uh, to reveal space to people who don't have access to it so you know i appreciate everybody commenting and um you know one way you can help me out um you know further that message and, or, and find more of my work and, and kind of follow along is i'm most active there on instagram you can see my username there the vast reach is all one word um i'm also somewhat active on other platforms i mean um anybody who gets deep into social media knows how hard it can be to keep up with everything but um you know i'll, I'll put some posts out there on facebook and twitter um, also on reddit i post occasionally uh, put images up on astrobin which is an astrophotography uh, oriented site and then i've got uh, you know prints i put out there um, you know for anybody who wants physical artwork um, that's available there I'm also working on, um, you know, expanding into some other platforms, but um, not ready for an announcement on that yet. So more to follow. Yeah. I, I appreciate everybody for the time and sticking around, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. And I want to thank you very much, uh, Jason, for spending this time and for joining our uh, Alliance uh, Ambassador Program. And uh, we've already talked about... Um, uh, the possibility of having uh, uh, maybe like an imaging session or something like that. Uh, yeah. So we'll see you back um, back here on Facebook. And um, we also share this if uh, you want to watch it again uh, or share it. Uh, it will be uh, it'll be shared up on uh, YouTube and um, uh, probably elsewhere as well. So thanks for watching. Uh, reach out to Jason if you need more technical help or you know more inspiration by looking at his images and uh you know, heck buy some of his prints man because uh they're pretty cool so 
Thanks again, uh, Jason, and thanks everybody for watching. Uh, and uh, uh, starting uh, tomorrow, we've got again Stephen Edberg, uh, retired JPL scientist, uh, planetary scientist. His talk is going to be on the uh, on gravitational waves and the LIGO interferometer system. He sat me down and explained to me exactly how this thing works, and it really is amazing. Um, uh, so it's, it's something that you're going to want, want to watch. And then on Saturday, uh, we've got uh, Rosalie Lopez. Rosalie is probably in the world, maybe of all time, uh, the greatest volcanologist of our solar system. So uh, that's something you're definitely going to watch as well. So thanks again, and, um, and we will see you uh, next, uh, actually tomorrow. Take care. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.